This program has been made possible in part by the following sponsors. The Trial Lawyers Association of B.C. The Vancouver Courier Newspaper. My new book about addictions, All the Way Home, Building Recovery That Works. Killers and kooks, lunatics and lovelies. Those are just some of the folks that our guest encountered in his stellar career in the constabulary. First, in that lovely neighborhood of Notting Hill in London, a neighborhood that I think has undergone some change in recent years, and then for a great many years, 27 years, right here in New Westminster, BC, he is, of course, either the son or the cousin or the brother of Clint Eastwood. It is Phil Eastwood who is here with us today. No relation, right? No, I've, I've yeah. tried many years to find it. Connected. And, and, you didn't, and, you, and you didn't carry a, a revolver? No, I didn't. Yeah, Not until I got here. Oh, did you? Yes. What did you carry with New West? Well, here we start off with a Smith and uh, Western 38. Yes. And then end up with uh, a Glock uh, 9 millimeter or semi-automatic. Good grief. I was never it? comfortable with either of them. And you never used them? No. Yeah, I, I remember having a chat once with the uh, Ottawa police chief because I was doing a TV show there, and he said uh, he never fired the gun in all his years. He was in on a raid once, but and he had it in his hand, but he never, never used it. Yeah. I think I had the reputation in New West of, of causing the most grief for the firearms training people because I was never very good at this, and, they, and I always used, was there constantly at the firing range, but uh, I had this... Just a real uncomfortable feeling about it. Yeah, but it's not. It's not your thing. No, your, it's not your, my thing. your thing, Phil, is communication. The thing that interests you the most, and that I think is your major, is your central skill, is communication. Yes, absolutely. So, so we'll talk about the current things you do in a moment. But let's go back to the lessons learned walking the beat in in Notting Hill, and and how you came to realize that the real skill for a policeman is listening. Well, I think it started uh, as soon as I got into training school in Hendon, where every police officer in London goes. Like, yes. they go to um, depot in for the RCMP in Regina. Yes. And when I first got there, they, ver they made it very clear to us that they were going to teach us how to listen to people, how to talk to people, and how to treat people really, really well. And they said if you did those three things, you wouldn't need any of the other tools that they were going to give you anyway. And so I didn't know what uh, policing was about. I had no um, background in policing, no relatives. And so that was news to me when I got there. Um, and I very quickly found out in Notting Hill that's exactly what you needed. You needed your ears, you needed your eyes, and you needed your mouth. Yeah, but you know, I have an article here from a uh, recent Vancouver Sun, and it's about training that's going on in Washington State these days with city police. And the history of their training has been you know, uh, uh, fighting. It's been it's been armaments, of course, but it's also jujitsu and self-defense and bringing people down quickly and how to twist an arm and so on. And now, all of a sudden, they're doing this other stuff, which some denigrators of these ideas, you know, think is too touchy-feely. And uh, actually, some people think it's dangerous. They think you'll get killed if you're too nice. But it's not a question of being nice, is it? It's a question of having situational awareness, as they call it, but understanding that the, 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 the most amount of communication can come from what you bring as an individual, as a human, not what you have on your tool belt, or literally around your waist. You know, the, the outcome of the, one of the outcomes of the Braidwood Inquiry with the YVR sort of nightmare that happened a number of years ago here yes. was to retrain police officers in how to demonstrate and use active listening skills, which is basically to listen, to display empathy, to ask questions, and to paraphrase. It's all about verbal communication. And some of it isn't even verbal. I mean, you tell a mm. wonderful story about one of your instructors, and, uh, and the instructor sort of pausing and getting lost as he's looking off into the middle distance. And you, and you had the courage or the good sense to say, excuse me, sir, what, what is it that's caught your attention? And it turned out to be something very powerful. 
It's all a question of silence is a great um, communicator. People, our, our natural instinct is, not, is, is to fill gaps of silence. So if you can use silence to your advantage as a, as a, communicating to, as a communication tool, it's a great way of, of, of gleaning other information from people because people will fill in silence with information. Yes. I, I, I once interviewed John Diefenbaker uh, after he was actually about a year before he passed away. And he had you know, been prime minister. And, and we got an hour of him on film in a hotel room. And half an hour through, he turned and looked at his assistant and said, oh, what do you make of this young fellow? I haven't, he hasn't said a word and I can't stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's exactly how it works. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the, the, the greatest interviewers in, that I've seen work in, in policing speak the, le the least amount of, of uh, you know, words in, in an interview. Did you, I, I have the sense, reading this lovely book, Handcuffs to Handshakes, mm, um, uh, Leadership Lessons from More Than 30 Years of Handling Humans, I didn't get, I don't think I got any stories about you doing interrogations or, do, or that sort of thing. No. You, you were much more out on the street. Absolutely. I, yeah. I, I didn't spend, the only time I spent as, a, as, a, as an investigator yes. um, was working as a professional standards officer for the New Westminster Police. Other than that, I was in uniform my entire career. What, what, what brought you, was it your wife? Was it, what, what, what brought you to Canada? Absolutely, it was my oh, wife oh. Yeah, at the time. Yeah. Um, so I, um, plus it was a, a real sense that uh, London at that time was a very violent city and uh -huh. not a great place to bring up a young family that we had in, intentions on. Yeah. So, um, and did you at the time? Did you live right in the city? Absolutely, we lived in right in Hammersmith. Ah, yeah. okay. So, yeah. um, right in the in the middle of, of not downtown Van in downtown uh, London, but yes. certainly in the middle of the city for sure. Yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. So enough of, a, of, a, of an experience to know that that wasn't a, a great place to bring up our kids. Well, I, I lived for a year in Porchester Square in W two, you know, and uh, it was quite central. I mean, easy to get. To, to the touristy kinds of things in central London, uh, didn't it wasn't very rich, you know. I mean, we were just we were teenagers, and living pretty cheap off the hog. But I had no sense of of violence. There may have been criminality, but if there was, I didn't see a lot of it. I felt quite safe there. That's a lot of years ago. And I think that there definitely are areas of London which are safe. Yes. Um, I think when you're in policing, though, you tend to see um, your community with a, a different set of eyes yeah. than maybe the average citizen. And so I knew that uh, where I lived in, in Hammersmith, and in fact, you know, anywhere in, in, the, in, the, in the downtown core of, of London, was not going to be a, a great place. So uh, The way you see, this is an interesting thing mm -hmm. to me, 27 years in New West as a policeman. Now, the day you left the force, did you see the community differently? <laughs> Were you suddenly seeing the community in a different way because you no longer had to be so vigilant? I think that's, that, that will eventually go. I still look at license plates and for their ex insurance expiry dates, it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> that's, um, <laughs> that's real OCD. I have yeah, someone I'm, I'm you can talk about, to about yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, so I'm, I'm hoping that that will eventually uh, disappear. Yes. Uh, but, but I think you know, the, the expression old habits die hard is, yeah, is, sure. a, is, a very, is a truism for me, for sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, who's the who's the spookiest person you ever encountered? In your, because after the break, which is imminent, we'll, we'll go in a totally other direction. But in, in your policing work, who, who tell us about a big challenge with someone? I met uh, an individual um, uh, during the Notting Hill riots. We, we spent a weekend in, in, uh, in yeah, I suppose, in 1980, whatever that was, one, I suppose, um, dealing with a, a riot uh, situation in, in, in Notting Hill, uh, which was a mirror image of what was going on in Brixton in South London. Yeah. And there was a guy there who, uh, one of the community ringleaders, um, trying to sort of stir up trouble in the community. And I met him uh, on my own one evening, and he was an enormous, imposing figure that really had us, that was just full of, of power, not only in terms of what he physically brought uh, to that uh, confrontation, but also what he was able to do in the, in, in the community. And I think that that's, a, that's a memory that will live me with me for a while. And again, I was just Phil and uh, was able to sort of have, engage him in a conversation, and, uh, and I survived that night. Um, 
but he would be one of those individuals that really uh, kind of concerned me. It's kind of, it's kind of a, a negative if a policeman, uniformed or not, begins by throwing his authority around, isn't it? Mm -hmm. How do you avoid doing that, especially if you're uniformed? Because so many, so many policemen, I'm sorry to say, this is an unfortunate comment, but it's my experience, their uniform, in a sense, comes first. They're, they're really inflated by the uniform. Well, one of the things that I think, and, and there's, a, there's a lot of, of background here to, to look at, when we, um, when we were doing, um, police officers can get themselves into trouble because of, of their attitude that they bring to situations sometimes. So I think we, the, the focus on them being human, I think, is an important thing. And anyone that wants to be a police officer because they like the uniform is, is a poor hire. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so... We're going to take a break, and uh, when we come back, let's talk about uh, how you've taken all those lessons <laughs> and put them into the group work that you do now, and you work with corporations and individuals. And so Thank on. you. Yeah, okay. So we'll take a little breather, and uh, Phil Eastwood is our guest again. His book is Handcuffs to Handshakes, and, uh, you know, he's taken away from all those years on the beat a sense of what does leadership really mean. We'll find out in a minute just after this pause, the opportunity for... Uh, you to send a note to us here at davidburner.com. Always happy to receive your comments. And also for those lovely people to su who support us to say hi here on Shaw Community Television Cable 4 back in a second. This program has been made possible in part by the following sponsors. The Trial Lawyers Association of B.C., Vancouver Courier Newspaper. My new book about addictions, All the Way Home, Building Recovery That Works. Right, here's one of my favorite quotes from uh, Phil Eastwood's wonderful book, Handcuffs to Handshakes. He says, all human beings desire the four things in, these four things in, li in life, to be valuable, to be capable, to be important, and to be understood. So now, by the way, where did that come from? Uh, what was the experience? Was that something to do with Princess Di that day? That was certainly something I learned on that day. Oh. Um, it was... It was to do with uh, something my field trainer had always taught me. And that when, when you're looking for, this is a chap called Taft Dowling, when you're looking for the connection with people. Yes. And he brought out these four things that uh, when people, are, when you see someone that is out of sorts, that's having a bad day, that's, that's just not fitting in particularly for that day, yes. one of those things will be missing out of their life. And it becomes you know, someone's job my job, some, your job, to, yes. to, to recognize which of those is missing and to try and, you know, to uh, allow that person to sort of have a, a, a fulfilling experience. Really, when you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's, exactly. it's taken right from there, right? I just, I just had a on copy the, of that yeah. on a bookcase at home, tore it up, put it in the garbage because I've, I've read it 64 well, times. Self-actualized, you don't need it anymore. <laughs> well, yeah, 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 yeah. So now you, you operate uh, a business called, do you say Fiore or Fiore? Fiore. Fiore, very good, the real Italian pronunciation. Fiore Group Training uh, in North Van. And what do you do? We specialize in respectful workplace training and um, it, within the corporate world and yes. also workplace violence prevention training. So two of those things that are, in BC anyway, are regulatory-based uh, pieces okay. out of WorkSafe BC. Okay, let's start with mm. respectful workplace. I would think today that this would be a massive challenge because we have an entire generation of people who A, are not used to working, and B, are entitled to everything and, and who you can't say anything to. You can't tell them. You can't text on your cell phone while you're serving coffee. They won't listen to you. They think that's peculiar. 
Context is everything. Okay. <laughs> and perspective is everything. So what do you well. do in a situation like that? Well, I think what we try and do, we, we try and create, uh, with, within the training that we provide, yes. what, we, what we want to do is to, is to talk about the importance of having a positive work, workplace culture, first of all. Yes. And, and that stems from taking a real interest in the person that they're working alongside, taking a, and not just treating them as, another, as, a, as an employee that they hang around with for eight hours a day, but really yep. getting to know you and what yep. you like and don't like. Uh, so that I can manage my behavior around you so that if I'm doing something that, that ticks you off or annoys you or embarrasses you or makes you sad, that unless you tell me, unless, I, unless I'm sort of highly intuitive, um, I'm not going to know because I may not pick up on the, on the body language or the, yeah. or, the, or the other sort of uh, fairly obvious signs sometimes yes. uh, that I'm doing something that's not making you uncomfortable. So we talk a great deal about what a workplace culture should look like and uh, the fact that these are really important relationships. Before we get into talking about how we can, um, what, what each generation that we right, speak right. to in, those, in yeah. our corporate training, actually, um, you know, how they communicate differently. You know, if you, if you ask, I was seeing a, a documentary on the television the other evening about how, how very few people actually write letters to themselves these days. It's all right. text, it's all, right. it's all you know, touching um, yeah. uh, pads and things. So it's, we, we communicate in very different ways these days. So What would you do if somebody came into your, your shop, into mm. your group training, Inc., and said, look, I want to light a fire under some of my people. And that's their core. That's their core issue. <laughs> in, in other words, he wants people to 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 start opening up and giving more of themselves, to being more of themselves. Right. Well, I think my suggestion, just yeah. based on that yeah. small snippet there, yes. is that leadership comes from within, and people will follow and mirror someone else that they see doing something. So a, a boss or a supervisor or a manager or a CEO can come in with a big stick and say, oh, you know, you know. You know, beatings will continue until morale approve, improves around here. They have to sort of yes. demonstrate that themselves, and then I, as an employee, as, as a line supervisor, will see that and, and then want to mirror that. Uh, Do you find it corny or, or ill-advised to also say out in English what we just did? In other words, let's say you model good behavior for your employees. Mm -hmm. Do you find it counterproductive to say, by the way, did you learn anything from what we just did? Because I, I, I think it's quite useful. I think there's a great deal of, of value in having um, open discussions because yes. not everyone will be paying attention to the nuances sometimes, and they'll right. be and they'll be looking at other things. Like if, if you know, they may be just judging the boss on on yeah. what he or she is wearing that day, and that's right. their focus in terms of actually uh, listening or watching the, the the body language. Right. Yeah. Okay, what about uh, uh, this work safety issue? Because that's the other half of what you were talking mm. about. Well, we've had in, in British Columbia, and, and it was actually the first province in Canada to engage w uh, workplace violence prevention legislation way back in 1995, and now every province and territory has it, uh, which mandates um, every organization in the province to do four things. Do a risk assessment on your workplace, create a policy document, do training, and then if an incident does happen, besides, uh, despite all those things, do a, do a review of that incident to say how can we prevent or minimize this happening in the future. Right. Very much same, uh, the legislation for around bullying and harassment arrived in, in BC in 2013. We became the fifth Canadian province to get that legislation. And it, it talks also about that same sort of thing. We, we need to do risk assessments, we need to create a policy, we need to do training, and then we need to really keep an eye on the workplace and giving ourselves different responsibilities for employees, supervisors, and particularly. If, if there were a charter of rights for workplaces, wouldn't safety, and I'm not talking about physical safety, of course mm -hmm. physical safety is, is basic and tantamount and foundational, but wouldn't safety, like sort of emotional, social safety, be, be a cornerstone of a workplace? It's a very interesting topic. The, um, when we do our training, we talk yes. about, uh, and I use the policing uh, industry as, or the law enforcement yes. industry as, yes. as, as a sort of a model because that's where I spent my entire life. Um, right. when, when, a, when, a police, when a person um, applies to be a police officer, they are joining an organization, an industry that is full of tradition, full of history, full of predictable types of behavior. And the given that is never spoken about is the emotional safety that one should feel when one goes there. But 
even in policing, even in law enforcement, you've yes. had situations where it's not a safe psychological place. You, you know, the RCMP has a class action lawsuit running through the country at the moment. There, there have been situations in many different jurisdictions where police officers, and, and this is not just SWAR members, but civilian staff as well and volunteers, yes. have, have been on the receiving end of some really you know, awful types of behavior. Yeah. So, yes, it should be a given, David, but it's not. Yeah, if, we, if women are having to register complaints about sexual harassment and so on, it's a nightmare. And it's not just a, it's not just a gender issue as well. Yes, I mean, yes, the, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I know this is not your bailiwick, and I know you, you, you told me already when we spoke on the phone that you don't want to become an essayist about these issues. But from your background mm -hmm. in policing, what do you experience when you read about police in, in various American cities shooting some guys 16 times, 15 of those shots are when he's already on the ground? You know what? I mean, you must be horrified when you read this kind of stuff. Well, it's, it's happened in, in other cities around the world as well. Yes. There was a situation in London when, when I was still working there where a chap who was wanted for a series of, of armed robberies um, was, was shot in, in Kensington High Street. He, um, really? And he wasn't armed at the time. He wouldn't get, he, the yes. police officer misread perhaps uh, the information about him trying to get out of a car. He was sort of bending down to open the car door in his mind. The officer may have interpreted that as a, him going for a weapon, and the car was, uh, you know, filled with with bullet holes. The guy didn't actually, fortunately, didn't die. Yeah. But when you see the, um, the the situation where there's such a, a reliance on other tools than other than, than the basic communication tools that we're given and the observation skills, uh, it, it it concerns me. So uh, so when the police drive up, and there's a. 14-year-old boy with a toy gun at a pergola in a public park, and they don't, even, first of all, they didn't even get the message that this, that was probably a toy gun. When they don't even pause for a moment to say, hello, what do you think you're doing? Or something, or is, what you know, and they just come out firing, you know? I mean, it, it, of course, America is a gun culture in a way that Canada isn't, but still. I, I need to sort of stress to you that yeah. uh, the, the, the training that I experience every year yes. as a police officer in, in U.S. Minister, and this is done provincially yes. as well, uh, was always based around trying to have, make that split second, second decision between yes. what was a um, not even a weapon versus a non-lethal weapon uh, and versus a, a, a lethal weapon. And, and sometimes the decision, the, the delay in making those decisions can be the difference between life and death on both sides. Have you ever heard, have you ever heard in all of your training, and I know you're very sensitive to this and because this is what you write about and you mm. think about and you use in your work with Fiore Group, have you ever heard a, a teacher at, at a police academy say things like, Gentlemen, ladies, you are not God. Remember that. <laughs> you know, the uniform doesn't give you license to just create mayhem. The, um, the I, I haven't heard that, yeah. fortunately. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, because I think it. But 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 the the opposite of that is is about the knowing that the uniform and the and the role in in the society comes yeah. with a massive responsibility. Huge, huge, huge responsibility. Yeah. And nobody, and, nobody, including me, questions the danger. Of course, it's, it's a dangerous occupation. And, and I think that the, what is reinforced continually in my yes. experience is the fact that that responsibility needs to be used responsibly, yeah. needs to be used professionally, used to be used in a, in a mature way. And even though p people will find themselves in highly stressed situations, we know when the body is, is in a stressful environment, yeah. it, it goes through this you know, this angular ar arousal cycle <laughs> where, where, where the brain, the, the blood is rushing from the brain into the major muscle groups and so you're not able to think as clearly as you should be able, which is why the training and the, and the, and the practice and the, and the, and, and the, uh, the consistency of, of, that, uh, of those exercises that we went through is so, so vital because yeah. you don't want people to, um, to, have, <laughs> to be second guessing, I suppose, or not guessing at all. Yeah, and I would think that most police officers, and obviously you were one of these, uh, really don't want anybody dying on their on their watch. <laughs> the, 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 and the training is de is designed to, to prevent that from happening. Absolutely, Phil. So great. Thank you. So David. great. Thank and you. We hope we put up your website on the screen a few times. So we hope you get some customers coming to your training groups. Thank you very yeah. much. <laughs> Thanks so much. So next week, uh, Tom Sanborn, a, a friend and journalist, and a, a, a grieving mother named Christine Harris, will talk about some un ridiculous inappropriate, untimely deaths in what are called supportive housing units. How supportive could they be? 
Uh, thanks for being with us today. We look forward to seeing you again here soon on Shaw Community Television Cable 4. Good night.